All right, recording started. Um, so I will do a bit of intro uh, first. Um, yes, hello everyone, and uh, thanks for coming to today's Temporograph Reading Group. We are very excited to um, to host Professor Peter Holm, um, who is a professor of network science at the Department of Computer Science, Aalto University, Finland, and a research fellow at the Center of um, Computational Social Science, Kobe University, Japan, formerly home held uh, faculty positions at the Tokyo Institute of Technology, Japan, um, San Kong Wang uh, University in Korea, and, uh, uh, and Yumea University and the Royal Institute of Technology, Sweden. His research covers a broad scientific ground in the borderlands between the social and formal sciences, among many other things, Home pioneered the study of temporal networks. Um, Home has over 190 um, publications and uh, and over 19,000 citations. And to add a personal note, so I've seen like like a lot of great work from him as well. And we are very excited to have you today. Uh, thank you, Andy. It's my pleasure to be here. And uh, yeah, thanks for the invitation. So this Thanks. talk, I I thought, what what would you kind of be interested? In? I'm I'm sure usually you have some kind of presentation of a paper or something, but uh, I'm a bit more of a veteran in the field, and I thought maybe it's better if I just kind of talk about my journey in in this field, how I became interested in it, and like my background. So you gave an introduction, but essentially the entire talk will be just an introduction for myself. So, okay. So, yeah. So, I started as a PhD student in, in statistical physics. And if you look to the left, it's a kind of typical picture from the textbook picture in the class of, uh, of statistical physics. It's the Ising model, which is a model of magnetism like essentially if you have a kitchen magnet and you heat it up eventually it will undergo a phase transition and fall down and there is a very simplified model called the easing model or icing model uh, that uh, describes this phenomena i really like this type of uh, uh, this kind of model thinking this abstract thinking uh, as a phd student i enjoyed the simulating it and coding and things like this but i really didn't like the fact that my my friends and family didn't understand what i was talking about and they didn't care so around that time i i i had a I have a friend who's a sociologist and he told me about uh, thomas schelling's segregation models so uh, have you heard about the schelling segregation model can i <laughs> Raise your uh, hand. <laughs> it, ta it takes a while in Zoom. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but you might want to give some background on that first. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so, yeah. I mean, so in the 1970s, America, like racial segregation, uh, there was a hot issue and uh, there was a lot of racial tension. So Schelling made a kind of very simplified model uh, like a, where you have just kind of um, a lattice model where every square in the lattice can have one of three states uh, kind of empty or occupied with one or two races. And uh, he used this model to make the point that people don't have to be have like a very strong bias for racial segregation to happen. So what we see in society is kind of uh, is a very amplified uh, version of how people actually are on average. Uh, so, I mean, you, you, but now I want you to see just visually that there is a big similarity between the Ising model and, and this Schelling segregation model. And that was kind of like what saved me in academia, because uh, I, I realized that there is a place for people who can think both kind of abstract and make things that uh, um, appeals to a broader audience. So, but I had a very kind of topsy-turvy way in my career, like uh, already from my physics studies, which was not about physics. And then I've been to like, computer science. Like in, in Korea, I was in the energy science department. In uh, Japan, I don't even know, uh, some interdisciplinary institute. Now I'm in Finland in a computer science department. 
So I'm, I've been moving around a lot in my academic life and also in the world. Uh, okay, so yeah, uh, here is a, another slide to kind of uh, explain a bit uh, how I'm maybe is, is a bit different from you that my, compared to machine learning is a lot about prediction. I think I my roots are in natural science. So I'm more uh, keen on kind of explaining things in words and kind of as the teach school teacher, maybe. And like uh, in the spectrum between data and theory, I think I'm more to the data side. I, I really like to kind of use data to pin my uh, science to the reality and not just be in some uh, yeah very uh, mathematical world. Uh, and about data itself, I usually use passive data sets. Um, I mean, I, I try to to kind of collaborate with social scientists, usually sometimes biologists, to get um, kind of more uh, rare data, like some some something that uh, potentially has kind of tells more about. Um, so I, I don't go for this kind of like big uh, and uh, cheap data set which many other people go to. So it's a way to kind of stay away from where everyone else is to, so, so you don't have to stress out so much. Uh, so I'm trying to find more kind of exclusive uh, data sets. We'll see some examples of that later. And I, uh, like, I'm like, i not the kind of person who goes to the depth of, of the details. I really, really like to collaborate with different people. What, what really drives me as a scientist is, is to kind of I collaborate with people from different backgrounds and see, get to hear their perspectives. And yeah, I'm, I think I'm very like wide in that sense. Okay, so now I'm uh, coming slowly to the topic of uh, temporal networks or dynamic graphs, call it what you want. There are lots of words for the same thing. Um, and I, I think like it, uh, all, all this, uh, field has its kind of intellectual roots in structuralism, which is like, a, uh, it's a, a movement or kind of a movement, how can I say? Yeah, well, in, in a 20th century thought that roughly says something that we can, we have to understand things by the way it's connected to, to other things, uh, which sounds to me very much like a network approach. Although, although I mean, there are some subtle differences, but but this uh, um, bearded gentleman uh, looking to the left, they are ex except Claude Levi Strauss, they they are like forerunners in, in the in structuralism. Uh, it's also very, it's very kind of like a vague movement, but but it kind of has a lot of things that resonate with me. Emil Durkheim was a sociologist, but then on the sociolinguist linguist, and Claude Levi Strauss, who is the person you should really read. He's an anthropologist, and uh, I mean his books are very readable, even if you're uh, not specializing in anthropology. Uh, but not all men like the this is about the beginning of like network theory and there were this kind of exceptionally early duo uh, Jacob Marino and Helen Jennings and uh, uh, who, who did this in social network studies in the 1930s and I mean Marino was a like a psychologist and uh, he was uh, he was kind of mad. He, I think he, he thought he was Jesus and sometimes so. yeah, you should read his biography. Uh, I have, but I also <laughs> forgot a lot. I mean, he, he was a like spectacular personality, but not a great uh, scientist. But Helen Jennings was uh, the, the brain and the scientist. So all, all fields have a kind of forgotten uh, female hero and Helen Jennings is ours. So, so um, they made many papers, but but this one that I I have in the figure here is really incredibly uh, just re remarkable. But at this point, uh, there was no like random graphs, I and mean, they they kind of uh, 
uh, this is the like first paper using a random graph. It's the first paper that kind of defines network structure as something different from randomness. Also uh, uses uh, kind of random graphs as null models to define the structure. And it's also the first paper that uh, has a plot of a degree distribution, which is something very common these days. So, so yeah, but, but this uh, like, uh, the structure, the structuralism, the, the structure of the data can come in different flavors. And I used to kind of think of my own work as like, it's mostly about networks. Uh, sometimes the network is embedded in time. That's when we get the temporal networks or dynamic graphs, and sometimes in space. So so this uh, other, the features, as you would, would call it, like uh, relating to like time and space, it, it, it's not really, I mean, these three uh, aspects are not exactly kind of, you cannot translate one to another directly, but, but uh, this is roughly how I organize my topics uh, in, in my mind. I think this slide is from a job talk some time ago when I kind of tried to structure my own uh, research interest. I always have problems to, to sound kind of focused because uh, it, it uh, topics are a little bit everywhere. Um, uh, just a question: yeah. uh, What yes. do you mean by uh, small network science? Oh, okay. That that's another. You have to kind of bring me back to another seminar. So okay. I, I have this idea that I mean, uh, or line of research. Or, uh, a lot of um, uh, current like data science and so on. It's, it's all about sc um, big data scaling it to. Uh, like a uh, huge size, uh, right. but uh, so, so I was like, uh, what if we go the other way and, and look at, uh, um, use like, a, allow ourselves to use slow algorithms, exponential algorithms, and then instead study a lot of small <laughs> networks. I mean, in that case, you can answer questions like, uh, what is the smallest network with this and that? property and so on. So I have a few papers about that, but it's really a different talk. Uh, <laughs> thanks. Yeah. So, um, okay, so back to this kind of like uh, structure and uh, this kind of overlap between fields. So, uh, so geographers are, are I'm, I'm very much a fan of geography. And there's a lot of uh, good ideas if you check their li literature, especially um, from the 60s. I have a blog post about that if, you, if you're interested in some references. So, so this is a, one, one example how, of uh, geographers thinking about processes in space and time at the same time. This is not a network thing, but they, they re, here replaced uh, one of, of uh, the time dimension by a space dimension and uh, map a person's uh, uh, whereabouts uh, during a day, so you kind of uh, follow this trajectory in a 3D space, which is a, a really kind of a projection from the four-dimensional space-time. Uh, this is a more elegant way, also from the, the geography literature, of showing the same thing, I think. So, so this uh, every plot here represents a person, and, and every uh, node in these networks is a, a type of activity, I think. Uh, and and then the arrow shows like how you go from one to another during the day. So also representing uh, a day in a person's life. So, so this is uh, like a temporal ego net. Yeah, 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 you can say that. Yeah, it, it's like ego net. I mean, it's like... A, um, it's a network of of activities, not of, of uh, so. It's not a social network in that sense. Okay, I see. But but it's an elegant representation and an example of how good uh, geographers are or were. I, mean, I think they still are good um, at uh, uh, coming up with this type of graphical representations for for stuff. And it's a like first uh, example of temporal networks. So that that's where I'm going now. And now the next few slides will be the typical introduction I, I give to people who are much less specialized than you. So you can just 
relax and enjoy. Uh, so I I always take this uh, proximity network. So I'm like who is close to whom and what uh, at what time as my example. So in this uh, cartoon, we see a girl going around in her everyday life. So uh, highlighting this uh, binary interaction that forms a network and the temporal uh, the temporal aspect as well. So we have these two aspects that both can have regularities and structure uh, that we can then decode and uh, to understand like uh, the social life that she's experience, experiencing. Okay, so on to a, a visualization of a typical type of data set that I have that also kind of shows how um, like uh, what kind of information is in the uh, temporal network? So, so th this is, comes from a um, collaborate no a project called the Socio Patterns. Maybe you heard about it. So, it, it, it's a group in, in based in France who put this RFID tags on people in some kind of given social context. So, in this case, it, it's uh, kids in a school. So all this data, the data is only recording like who is close to whom at what time, like close meaning one and a half meter. Um, and uh, what we have seen right now, I mean, maybe I should kind of rewind and play it again. Uh, so at, at this point, they are having lunch in, in the school canteens and this, I, um, Kids from like uh, grade one to six. Uh, the, um, so they are, have lunch in two separate rooms. Then they're going back to, uh, maybe now they're having lunch. Then they go back to the kind of main classroom building together or everyone. So it's a small school. And then they split up in, into different classrooms. So the, the blobs here represent uh, like one class. Um, and the, the the squares are are the teachers. So, I mean, what I want to show is that even though the information here, so now now we see they're splitting into different classrooms here. Uh, even though the the information is is just like who is close close to whom at what time, you can kind of it gives a narration of the. Uh, entire school day, essentially. I, I should maybe have started it from, from the beginning. I think this uh, film clip uh, cut uh, out the beginning. Um, but uh, yeah, so the the kind of mission of, of uh, temporal networks or random gra graph, no, uh, <laughs> dynamic graph theory is to kind of decode this and tell the, the story. Right? Automatic, kind of, uh, automatically. Okay, so yeah, oh, the, the, this is now going to be uh, very simple for you, but I, it's just the slides are here, so why why don't I talk through them? So this is how I explain it yeah, to, to people who are not so familiar. So like the uh, typical temporal network data set comes in this very simple machine readable format with three columns uh, saying like who is close to whom or like who is doing something and sending an email to someone and at what time. So two ID numbers and a time. This is easy for computers to read, but uh, not so good to, when we want to think about something or like say we want to explain the, the spreading phenomena or think about some kind of measure or like some algorithm or so, so on, that we need to represent it. The, uh, one way of, of like a static representation of a temporal network is the, to uh, visualize it as a, this timeline of nodes where uh, one person is uh, one horizontal line and uh, contact uh, between two nodes is uh, represented by this uh, vertical uh, uh, line. So this is good to, to show uh, some type of temporal structure, but it, it doesn't show the network topology or network structure at all. So of course we can kind of re represent the network as a, a graph as we used to do. And uh, then maybe put the, the uh, times of the context 
contacts on the edges, but but then we don't we lose all the feeling for for the temporal structure. So this is a di dilemma. Like while uh, regular static graphs have this uh, uh, strong graphical component that we can just see them and understand immediately what's going on. Temporal network doesn't have that at all, and this is a is a bit of a dilemma. But uh, there is, no, I, I'm sure there is no um, like optimal solution. But it's a kind of research topic: how to visualize uh, temporal networks in a static kind of two dimensional plot. Of course, we we would have to make a compromise. We can't have it all. But uh, how to do that is it's a bit of I think it's an interesting open research question still. Okay, so yeah, let's continue my uh, let's start my journey. So so my very first paper about something like temporal networks was when I was a PhD student. So essentially, I I didn't have any senior person who who knew about networks at the time. So I was going by myself. Uh, pretty much, but but that wasn't. This, it sounds maybe, it sounds uh, impressive. It, it's not meant to be because actually everybody was like that at the time. Net, network science at, at at this time was like a boom in physics, meaning that many people jumped from other topics to networks or graphs, and nobody knew anything. So <laughs> you could get away with uh, pretty shitty papers, honestly. Uh, but but this one I kind of came out <laughs> reasonably well. So this is my first uh, um, paper about something like temporal networks. So uh, so it comes from this insight that at the, the, the time people studied the uh, network structure of like kind of accumulated contact. So you take all the emails in some kind of email account or a collection of them and link them together, make a network and study that. But in many of such data sets, uh, especially if they, they came from some kind of online uh, interaction, and th these were the days before social media when there were online communities, for example. And then those people can come and go. So those that are there in the beginning are, are not there at the end. So in this paper, I, I tried to uh, make a statistical uh, method to, to kind of uh, estimate like which uh, links that are kind of dead at, and so we get and can have a network of uh, a kind of ongoing active contacts and and uh, th this figure shows that if you do that then, then you get uh, like a degree distribution that is like a bit more like a power law so th this was a, another thing that was hot at the time it, it isn't anymore uh, thank, thank God for that. Anyway, um, uh, so it, 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 but but in other aspects too, like if you have a, make a network of ongoing contacts, it, it got it gets a little bit more cleaner. The statistics. So uh, so uh, another conclusion was that if we take the temporal network data set or dynamic graph and look at the the kind of communication between two nodes. And if we uh, if we say that um, uh, at a given time all the contacts that had the contact all the links that had the contact before and will have a contact in the future are kind of active, uh, that that's not a, a kind of uh, that's a relatively. Uh, Okay, I mean, you might make mistakes. There might be some link that kind of become active again, but it's not going to affect the, the results. So, uh, at least that was a conclusion in this paper. Okay, so on to some other, uh, let's see, some other other studies. So, so one thing. One thing I wanted to understand, like uh, and a realization that came to me many times, is that uh, temporal networks are a really different uh, creature from from static networks. Uh, I mean, the first thing you can see you can see from this example, for example, uh, that uh, being indirectly connected is has is not a transitive property in the mathematical sense, so, uh, meaning that. 
you can go in this plot you can go from a to b you can go from b to d but you cannot go from a to uh, d uh, like you you can reach uh, b by time 11 then all the contacts between b and d already happened but you can continue to c but then when you reach c at time 17 then all contacts between c and d already happen and th this is very uh, kind of fundamentally different from static graphs and a kind of an indication that temporal networks are really different um, and another way to to see that uh, was our first paper that kind of simulated disease spreading on top of temporal networks and try to understand like how the uh, temporal structure affects the disease spreading. So in, we used the data set uh, uh, from uh, a paper we published in PNAS 2010, which is about online prostitution. And that, that paper itself focuses on more like kind of the economics of uh, online prostitution. but. Uh, in a follow-up paper, we, we studied the uh, uh, disease spreading, and uh, this this figure shows the kind of like absolute uh, worst-case scenario when you have this SI model with 100% infection rate. So everybody, uh, if uh, two people meet and one susceptible, one infectious, the uh, susceptible gets infectious uh, immediately with uh, no probability. And then, but we wanted to study the effect of the order of events. So what if we take this original uh, temporal like list of contacts and then randomly shuffle the timestamps and keep everything else the same? Then what happened in, in our case was that the disease spread uh, slower in the randomized, uh, meaning that there is something in, in this data set uh, the original data set in the order of events that, that speeds up the disease spreading. Um, and, do you have some intuition about why a randomized uh, contact yeah. order would slow it down? Yeah, it has to do... I mean, it's it's difficult to make kind of give a very uh, simple answer to that, but it has to do with the fact that in this data set, people... Uh, there's kind of turnover of, of uh, people. Uh, so the data set itself spans six years, but uh, most people are, are just there for a month or so. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, we will come back to that. So actually, okay. So, um, so the effect there in the previous uh, page is not that big so the difference when you randomize it is not that big but i just i, I had some other more recent paper where we, where i compare uh, the spreading in a sr model in a temporal network and the kind of closest corresponding static network and in the traditional kind of fully mixed model um, and this is the um, parameter space of the SIR model, which is two-dimensional in, in for temporal networks. But uh, so so on the, let's see, on the x-axis is the uh, probability of transmission. And the, the y-axis is the, the average duration of the, the disease. So the, yeah, if the duration is long and the transmission probability is high, then uh, it spreads far, but in the temporal network, which I think this the temporal network here is once again, this prostitution data from, from the previous slide. But but still, it, it's that data is so sparse that uh, it, it doesn't reach more than 30% in this kind of worst case scenario. Whereas in, in a fully mixed model, it's a, like a big chunk of the parameter space where actually everybody gets infected. So, so yeah, so this is to say that it actually, temporal effects actually have a big impact on the spreading dynamics. Now, the story is that uh, when we, we wrote this paper, we put it on, on the archive, which at that time was uh, almost, almost only used by physicists, I think. Uh, I went to a conference right after this and uh, was chatting with a guy, a Finnish guy, uh, who is now my colleague, maybe because of this story. 
But uh, it turned out that they scooped us. They did the same same thing with a different type of data, though. The, they had like phone call data. Uh, and what they found uh, in the corresponding plot was the opposite. So, so in their data, uh, randomizing the contacts uh, speed up the uh, the spreading, which kind of means that the, in the original data there is a structure, which is actually more easier to to explain. There is a structure that slows down the disease spreading, and in this case, it's this burst in us. So it's like the um, the uh, discussion between two people uh, calling each other is usually uh, pretty intense. People call back and forth. Uh, you can imagine that they are uh, attending some event or something, so they need to coordinate or or, or something like that. Uh, so so that has a, an easier explanation that the right hand side, but. The why, but actually, this uh, prostitution data is also bursty in in that sense. So, so it uh, this other effect that I was uh, uh, briefly mentioning must be overriding the burstiness. It's complicated. Um, um, anyway, so yeah, we couldn't. We were chatting about this at the, that uh, conference I mentioned, but we couldn't figure out. Uh, a solution to it then, but we decided to write a, a book and a review paper. Oh, actually, a review paper. And the book is an edited volume. We now have a kind of a follow up uh, book about that. And there are also some other uh, books about this, which I can recommend, but maybe you already know most of this. I, I think you, you, Andy put one of this, uh, the, the um, paper to the right uh, on, on right. your homepage. This is on the reading group page. Yeah, so so this this now uh, what has become a bit of a field of temporal networks. Uh, it, it usually in, in this kind of network science community, it, it usually uh, revolves around these three questions. One, one is uh, like how structure affects dynamics. The, I already showed you one example showing uh, they are uh, mentioning this, how burstiness kind of slows down this uh, uh, spreading phenomena. Another one is to find the important uh, nodes and edges, the uh, kind of influencers or, or uh, whom you should vaccinate in, in the disease spreading or so on. Uh, and then another one is to, to kind of simplify the data to make a map of a, a temporal network the, there are maybe some other uh, a few other kind of directions but i think uh, most uh, papers kind of exist somewhere on, on this uh, three-dimensional space so so which kind of paper do you think live in the middle just curious uh something that uh, combines everything here uh i i yeah I have to think about that. I can't think of, of anyone okay. any such paper. Um, okay, I, I wanted to say a bit more about randomization techniques because that is something that turns out to become uh, more powerful for temporal networks than in static networks. And people have used it in static networks too, especially related to something called network uh, motifs. But it turns out to be more powerful so yeah, you remember this plot <laughs> just a few slides ago. Then, actually, the this other group, the the, the Finnish group who scooped us, um, they they did a lot more of randomization. Uh, so so they by by kind of randomizing uh, less and less, the curve would, would kind of converge to the original graph, and by doing that, you can say like how, what what structures that you need to kind of retain to. To reconstruct uh, the the original original curve, so this is somehow it's a bit like feature selection. You can say like which uh, features or which structures that are important to explain the phenomenon. Uh, but but actually, uh, this is a bit of my pride. I was the the first one who do who did some uh, temporal network. Uh, randomization from a, an earlier paper. So this is now kind of going back in time to, this is when I was a postdoc in Michigan in 20, 2005. I was uh, uh, studying this, uh, like 
essentially like how uh, uh, reachability it's something corresponding to like the the size of a component in a static graph like uh, showing that like at a given time like how on average if you start at one node like how many other nodes can you reach by time respecting paths and if you reach them how long time does it take the, those kind of questions and there we i mean this is just showing this is uh, maybe my second paper about temporal networks where i i uh, i I came up with this uh, like ways to, to permute things, but I didn't do it as elegant as the Finnish group. I didn't do it systematically to show like what you need to uh, keep to retain the uh, the observed uh, curves and so on. I uh, don't ask me to how to read this. It gives you some idea of what kind of data set we have now. Like now nowadays, I, I think I have a collection with like four hundred. Temporal network data sets. I mean, many of them are kind of versions of the same. So it, it's not really kind of 400 independent ones. But anyway, so the, we were studying this internet dating community and like three uh, uh, email data sets. One of them is the Enron data that I'm sure you're familiar with. But anyway. Okay, so on to some other, uh, uh, also a bit old, paper but i think it's kind of instructive and uh, this is about the vaccination problem which is essentially uh, in mathematical terms we can formulate it like this that how many how can we optimally choose a fraction f the people of like a fraction f of a population to vaccinate using only local information so assuming that we don't know the entire graph but we we can uh, query nodes about their neighborhoods but this uh, itself just this formulation if you really want to uh, operationalize it and make it a, a project you have to make a, a lot of uh, <laughs> you have to uh, interpret these words so when when i say optimally like what does it really mean is it uh, excess mortality or this uh, disease what is it? Uh, disability adjusted life years that public health community likes daily, or just in some economic terms, or uh, vaccinate. Like, uh, what can we assume about the availability of the vaccine and so on, uh, the efficacy, and uh, what does local information really, really mean? Do they actually know exactly? I mean, uh, of course, this is about like who meets whom, so it, it's very. Fuzzy. Maybe maybe a little bit easier if you think about sexually transmitted diseases, but but still, this uh, uh, the precise formulation. Uh, I I leave it to to you or like to anyone who wants to go in this direction. You can do different versions of every paper by interpreting these words differently. But for for this particular paper, optimally here meant just to kind of reduce the. Uh, final outbreak size in the SIR model. And the vaccination we assume is kind of instant, instantly 100% effective. And local information, what well, I, I will show you, well, it's essentially that you know know what your neighbors uh, did uh, or do. So there was a very elegant solution to this uh, for static graphs in 2002, which is called the neighborhood vaccination. And it goes like this, that you pick people at random, then you ask them to name a friend, and then you don't vaccinate the, the person you ask, but you vaccinate the friend. And the reason this works well in static graphs is that you're, you're sampling people on the other side of an edge, meaning that you're sampling them in proportion to the, their degree. And degree has like a, I mean, the importance of a person is... Uh, the square of the degree in some very simple understanding of disease spreading, right? Because you have, if you have twice as many friends, you have twice as many that can give you the disease and twice as many you can spread it to. So this was a simple, elegant solution that used only 
local information. So we wanted to do something similar for, for temporal networks. And one nice thing with temporal networks is that you don't have to assume that the past uh, predicts the future. So what we did is that we took the temporal network data set and split, split it into one half and then used the first as some kind of learning period uh, up to this half midpoint. And, and then uh, we let the disease start and do the vaccination at once just to, for, to keep it simple. So this is uh, showing one outbreak when um, everyone gets infected. And then we tried the different versions of this uh, neighborhood vaccination, like adapted to temporal networks. So one and two of them worked uh, better than uh, neighborhood vaccination, as we will see soon. So, so one we call it the recent version, which is picking people, uh, no, picking people at random and asking them who was your most recent contact, and then vaccinate that one. And by doing that, you can uh, you can kind of exploit this uh, um, bursty structure. So many times people are kind of, if they had contact recently, they are likely to have contact again soon. So by that, you can kind of pick other active people. And the other one that was uh, su successful was the, we call it the weight version, where, where we just pick the one that was the most frequent contact throughout this entire learning period. And so this is the su success plot or whatever, is, um, uh, containing only uh, four data sets. Uh, at this time, we were also very uh, data set poor. So once again, the prostitution data and the internet dating uh, community data, which I didn't describe. There is also a data, hospital data. This is maybe more interesting for actual disease spreading because it, it tells you who is uh, at the same ward in the hospital at the same time and the email data. So, so two conclusions. Okay, so first of all, the uh, x-axis shows the fraction of the population that we vaccinate and the y-axis shows the relative performance relative to the uh, neighborhood vaccination on the static graph. If we just run that, that one blindly. So that's our be benchmark. And we beat it for every data set and every F value. But with uh, for three of the data sets, uh, ABC, it's the, uh, the recent version is more efficient. And for the uh, th fourth one, it's the weight version. And here it also the, the, the explanation for this is relates to the, the, what we saw before. Uh, when we compare this uh, prostitution and, and phone call data. So, so in a ABCD, there is a high turnover of, of nodes in the network. People come and go to all these data sets. But in the email data, like the, the, those who are there in the beginning are also there at the end. Uh, like exact, so, so this is kind of the beginning of an explanation. And, and don't ask me for the middle of it. Uh, uh, at this point, I mean, I, I th it's uh, hard to explain. At some point, I had some epiphany moment that I think I, I understood. Uh, you can kind of recreate it with models, but, but even that uh, makes it a bit difficult to explain. And uh, and just a question on the, as you were talking about the random structure before, yeah. how, would, how would you randomly pick a vaccinate work in this case? Uh, I, I think it's just, oh, I mean, when we com I compare it to the uh, static uh, so, neighborhood vaccination. Right. Uh, and also to your own method. If you just randomly pick the vaccines, ignore all the local information, you randomly pick people from the population to vaccinate. Uh, yeah. I mean, when I, I pick them to query them, I, that, that is just uh, by uniform randomness among everybody that uh, is present in the data at that time, at the half point time. I see. I see. And, uh, in the, and I, I think also when we run this uh, static neighborhood vaccination, we, we use the static network by like aggregating all contacts at this midpoint. Okay. Let's see. Okay, so I have maybe okay. So 
here I'm, now I'm going to turn to a more kind of a recent project, but that actually is a project that is it kind of got stuck somewhere, uh, and I I don't know when I will uh, start it again. So the, the, I mean, as you get older, you you will notice like uh, when you're a student or a postdoc, your projects are very kind of well defined, and you either you ditch them and they're gone, or you, you finish them. But when you get older, there are all kinds of zombie projects that <laughs> floats around in in your mind and on your hard drive. Things get a bit uh, strange, and this is one of them. Which I I, I mean, if anyone gonna finish it. It will be me because my collaborators both left academia. Uh, but anyway, we'll see what happens. I, I think it's a bit interesting, but there are also like a lot of work to be done. So this, and if you want to collaborate or anything, yeah, hit me up. Uh, anyway, so this is about the, uh, yeah, like a more kind of no brain approach to what is the most important structure so essentially just kind of like measure everything and like uh, run uh, some regularized regression feature uh, extraction to to find the, the important features so uh, so so it it relates to the r not the, the basic reproductive number which, which uh, uh, b describes the very beginning of an outbreak so uh, i think uh, covid taught us all about all this terminology, so I don't have to explain it. But essentially, uh, yeah, it's it's a, describes how uh, how many uh, people the the first infected person is expected to infect, and um, that is kind of also correlated to the final outbreak size. Imagine now that there's a, not like COVID, uh, which can reinfect people, but but some uh, disease that where people get the uh, immunity, uh, become uh, uh, yeah immune to the disease after they have it. And that, that's something we call omega. So, so in this paper, um, I'm interested in, in two things. For, first, like what uh, how does the network structure predict R0? And then the deviation between R0 and this omega, what kind of explains that deviation? Uh, so in this plot, like every uh, point is a temporal network data set. Uh, they, uh, uh, I think I, I, yes, most of them are kind of relatively relevant. So they, they, they record like who is close to whom at what time. Some of that, uh, those are for animals. So the green ones, I think. And uh, there are also something that uh, like social media data set that are not really uh, so relevant, but but all in all, uh, R0 predicts uh, this omega, the final outbreak size in, in this data set. Uh, for this is a SIR model for some parameter value. I don't remember how it's chosen at this. I have to say this, this is all like kind of like three years old stuff. And that uh, yeah, anyway, so we we want to understand what predicts R not, and then the, what predicts uh, R not's ability to predict uh, omega. Uh, and then yeah, so so this approach, like as I said, is a bit uh, without thinking too deeply. We just measure everything. We measure uh, like. Descri uh, quantities describing the full degree distribution um, of, of different versions of static networks that we kind of project from the temporal networks. Uh, we, we measure different uh, temporal structures like the, the turnover rate of nodes and links and uh, duration of this and that. And uh, like so the, this uh, figure in the middle is, is a bit of a uh, legend for the what comes in the next slide. So uh, we use the elastic net to to uh, so for feature selection, and uh, only only these few uh, structural quantities turn out to be uh, relevant. And yeah, now I remember the the parameter values because that comes here. Like so so. 
so this is a kind of a map for for the relevant features and uh, this is kind of plotting this little map all over the the parameter space of the SIR model once again with the infection probability on the x axis and the uh, inverse recovery rate on the y axis so the most uh, uh, the biggest outbreak in the top right corner and the, the more kind of like complex situation is, is somewhere in the middle where you're close to the epidemic threshold and uh, i mean yeah, you can see there's some consistent pattern uh, at different part of the parameter space, different uh, temporal network features are, are more important. Uh, th this is, I think, for predicting on, yeah, like what features that predict the value of or not, I think. And uh, the most important kind of almost trivially is the number of contacts per individual, like how many contacts you have with others. The second one is the coefficient of variation of the of the network degree distribution. It's essentially, like how skewed, how broad, fat-tailed the, the uh, degree distribution is, which is also a bit of uh, expected result. This is for predicting R naught, but for predicting the deviation between R naught and omega. The, then there are like temporal things. So this is the kind of correction factor to, to uh, understanding the outbreak size. Then, then the average new node duration, like essentially like, which is also related to the turnover of, of uh, agents or individuals in this data set. And the standard degree of the same quantity, they, they turn out to be the most uh, common in the entire they are always there. That's the blue and, and red triangle in this plot. Okay, so this is kind of work in progress, kind of the, an idea of what something I think is a kind of a more modern project than this uh, previous uh, vaccination project. So I see my time is almost up. There was some other stuff I was going to say. Uh, and I also put it in the... Uh, in the the abstract to this talk. One thing that I learned is like generalizing from network theory is usually not straightforward at all. Taking a quantity from your network theory textbook and making a temporal network version of it is not easy. First of all, like every quantity becomes time dependent. And then like how to get rid of the time if you want to just have if you want to just have a number, not a, a graph, right? a plot of a quantity versus time that that is very uh, kind of problem dependent and depends on many assumptions like for for example uh, well this is a diff different example but like when should you start an outbreak if you run a disease spreading if you uh, start it i mean the principal way would be maybe to uh, do it just any time during this observation period, the duration of the data set, then you have a high chance of picking a time in the end of the data where, where you, uh, the epidemic just doesn't have time to spread to everybody else. Uh, but if you, I mean, however you do it, there will be some kind of bias. If you restrict yourself to the very beginning, uh, I mean, you introduce some type of uh, bias. So there is kind of no simple universal solution for, for many of these uh, things that uh, you may, when you start uh, coming to the field of temporal networks you think it's will be easy and straightforward but it's not so and and then uh, don't even get me started on, on the, the community structure which is uh, something that is very uh, it, it's a big thing for static networks it's a way to kind of simplify to make a kind of coarse grain map of a, a complex uh, data set but uh, for temporal networks, it's it's pretty difficult. Like, I mean, for example, assume that you have like the proximity data of every single person on Earth and like infinite computing power and so on. Then, then like say a conference should be uh, one community. But also like the like conference that kind of re repeats every year you can argue that they should come out as a community as well. And like, what, what is it really that, what does it even mean? And this uh, ship of 
thesis problem is another uh, issue. Like if you have like a, um, imagine like a, a group of people in a, in a classroom or like a, a executive people in a boardroom or something. And then one people uh, goes out from the room and another one comes in. And then event, that keeps happening until everybody is replaced. Is it the same group or is it a different? So, so it, it's a lot of kind of philosophical questions. Uh, I think that mostly comes from the fact that you take something that is very well defined for a static network and not, not so well defined for a temporal network. So it, it's the, the kind of our word or language that is uh, playing at some tricks again. And then it's also funny, and maybe you realize that when you hear me talk, that people are reinventing things. I mean, that's fine. I mean, we we cannot kind of see everything and follow all the literature. And it, it is a, a, this topic of dynamic graphs is something that relates to many people's fields. But but just how many times can people reinvent things? If you see in the literature, this is like incredible, and it makes the the vocabulary suffering. Like there are different words for the same thing, and same words for different things, and like temporal graphs. Some people say temporal graph and dynamic graphs they are different. Some people say it's the same thing. And, and I, yeah, I wrote a blog post about it, which is also linked on your uh, web page. So, so you can check it out if you're interested. And uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you for your attention. Uh, yes, thank you for the uh, like for the interesting talk. And uh, yeah, so I think it's a very broad and different kind of talk than what we had in the reading group before. So we had a lot more machine learning focused talk. I think this is a good look at basically like disease modeling, contact networks, and also different ways of thinking about the problem. So more from a high level rather than uh, you know focusing on a specific model or um, or design choice. And uh, and just to kind of follow up on what you were talking about, about we don't really know, you know, how to navigate through temporal graph or temporal network. Like we don't even have a standardized terminology. This is what I meant first. Like as you have a blog post on, uh, different people cause different stuff. And people also call temporal graphs as edge streams, streaming edges, yeah, streaming setting, yeah, streaming think, network. Basically- I think you have a list of like eight different terms for, for the topic itself. So. <laughs> And then when they talk about these terminologies, they like to introduce their own formulation of the network. So we don't have a standard like mathematical formulation of the network that everybody uses. There are some consensus now in like in the machine learning community, but still it's kind of in the beginning phase. And then yeah, like different paper to, to, to yeah. give up my own terminology for for <laughs> some uh, consensus there because I think it's very important that at least we don't have to kind of every single paper you have to kind of define everything and when you read it you have to kind of like you read what do they actually actually mean by by latency or, or uh, yes. distance and like yeah people have been a bit bad at that i mean it, it's not all like a uh, physics and applied math versus computer science it's actually computer science itself kind of don't read right. the old stuff <laughs> so right right for sure um, so is there any question from the audience before we wrap everything up? Uh, feel free to type your question in the chat as well, or um, or you can send a question to me and I can relay it as well. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so thanks again for the interesting talk. And, um, and that's been like very interesting and we'll post the video online as well. So more people can, uh, can go through the talk and get to know the interesting work that you are doing. Um, and if you have any like other materials like blog posts or book or like the reference to the books, like for example, you can send it to me and then I'll post on the website as well. So, so okay. we're trying to keep a centralized hub for uh, different uh, temporal graph like like related things in the reading group. So people okay, can, we'll do that. Um, I mean, if, if anyone has a question, they can also email me. Feel free to do that. Yeah, definitely. Um, all right. Um, Thanks, everyone, and uh, see you uh, at next week's reading group. Okay. Thank you. Bye. See you. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.